Welcome to this episode of Profess Hers, a podcast about movies, music, history, pop culture, current events, and literature, all discussed through the perspective of women's issues and feminism. I'm Allegra, and my favorite band from this era is definitely Queen, but they're not ladies. So for my lady anthem from this era, I think I'm going to have to pick the Fleetwood Mac song, The Chain which we're going to play later, and we have played before, in fact. Awesome. I'm Misty. My favorite performer from this era is Dolly Parton, not just for her music, but for some of her offstage sensibilities as well. Okay. Love the rhinestones. Got to. (laughs) The dazzle to the max. And I think my favorite song from this period, if you want to call it like a feminist anthem, Mm -hmm. is You Don't Own Me by Leslie Gore, but I like the remake by Grace a little bit better. Yeah, it's a little more modern. A little, little more, bit. A little more updated. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more palatable. Yeah, so if you can't tell, today we're talking about music. Not just music. Specifically music by women uh, from the 1960s and 70s. We're going to start a little bit in the late 50s. But uh, what th- things we kind of consider lady anthems or remarkable kind of musical achievements by women in the time periods. We want you to hopefully celebrate some songs you already love and hear about some great things that may be new to you. And we're going to connect all of that, of course. Yay, history. To history and the women's movements at the time. So Misty's going to start with the uh, 60s because they're... Well, because they're important. Historical. Yes. And I think we need to say the same thing we said with our TV episode. This is a survey. We're hitting the highlights. Yes. So please don't feel offended if we left your favorite person out. Right. We didn't mean to. You can definitely let us know. We'll include your favorite person in a later episode. And we'll definitely want to take a closer look at some of these musicians in future episodes, definitely. Right. So these are medium dives, not deep dives. Just I knew so you we're, were going to. I knew that you were going to use just, the phrase deep dive. I have to. I knew to. it was going to I have happen. to. I'm sorry. All right. So we're going to start talking about rock and roll, which okay. begins in the 1950s. And this is a new kind of music. Invented by Elvis, right? (laughs) No. I know. No. Uh, But this is the first music specifically targeted to teenagers Mm -hmm. who are this kind of new group with disposable income. Mm -hmm. We have a new type of business around music. Okay. So we're trying to make money. It's not just about being an artist. So again, capitalism Mm -hmm. is going to play a big part in this. And we have this new thing called the Billboard Hot 100. So it begins in the 19, 1940. Really? Yeah. And this is going to track our number one chart toppers, the pop music that we're all listening to. And I guess that's something else we should say. We're talking about pop music today. Mainstream pop. Mm-hmm. We're not going to get too far into country or Western or hip hop or right. yeah. gospel. <laughs> we're going to keep mainstream pop front and center. Yeah. And I mean, in the 50s, we didn't really have very many genres, right? We had some different genres, but to survive, to make it, you really had to blend. Like Elvis did gospel. Okay. Because he had to, to sell records. Mm -hmm. And as we get more record labels and more people buying records, Mm -hmm. you're able to kind of hone your skills. Okay. All right. So even though the Billboard Hot 100 begins in 1940, it takes 20 years for a woman to have a number one song. Allegra? Only 20? Only 20. (laughs) 1960. (laughs) We nailed it. We did. Do you know... The first number one song on the Billboard Hot 100 by a woman. It's got to be a song that's still just really popular today. No, it's just not. Um, Connie Francis has the first solo. Who? Yeah, Connie Francis has the first solo number one hit for a woman with Everybody Somebody's Fool. I already like it. It's very tangy. So definitely a feminist anthem. For sure. All about independence. Written by two men. Lovely. Lovely. 
I think we get the idea. Yeah. It's unfortunate. So that's our first number one chart topper by a woman. It is. And it if you almost like a Christmas song, to be really? honest. Yeah, it's just But I think it's just the kind of hokey beat. So if you listen to the lyrics there, the narrator here, which Carney Francis is singing that point of view, mm-hmm. it's all about the tears she's cried for this guy, mm-hmm. about how she's his fool, that she's trying to forget him, but she can't. And she's just kind of heartbroken over it. So while that is not a theme that we're going to move away from, there are still Definitely songs about not. that. We're still doing that theme. It's very much a passive role the narrator yeah. is playing. She has no agency of her own. Mm-hmm. So do you think it's a feminist song? Absolutely not. Yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, I'm glad that a woman got to the tar- the top of the charts. But <laughs> beyond that, I... Uh, there's room for improvement? There's definitely room for improvement. So the next phenomenon that's going to happen in music that relates specifically to women is the arrival of girl groups. So this happens in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Is this what I'm thinking of? The sequins? Oh, yeah. Lined up and matching. Bouffant. Outfits. Choreographed dance moves. Snapping their fingers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Shimmying. Yes. So there's actually a lot of academic research about this. Good. And yeah, I had a really good time going through all this. This is fun for me. How Misty defines fun. You I guys. know, right? This is a good weekend for me. On the weekend? Yeah. And yet you're too busy to go to the movies. Because I have academic research, research to do. The Shirelles. Okay. Yes. Whatever you say. So academically speaking, yeah. a girl group is defined as three to four young females, typically teenagers, mostly African American, though there were some white groups. And these are girls who sing and harmonize, but they do not play instruments. Okay. So think the Crystals, the Shirelles. The Ronettes, the Supremes. Which one of those groups would you say was the all-time Supreme? I would say the Supremes. Okay. Diana Ross and the Supremes were Good. the Supreme group. I'm glad it was appropriately yes. named. Yes. Um, not by them, though. No. By Barry Gordy. So these girl groups, mm-hmm. you know these songs even if you don't think that you do. So as an example, mm-hmm. the Marvelettes mm-hmm. are going to have the first number one song for Motown Records. And they sang, Please, Mr. Postman. And I promise you, you know this song even if you don't think you do. You've heard this, right? Yeah. What is it about? She's waiting on a letter from her lover. And the postman needs to bring it to her now. Okay, so we're still waiting around for a man. Yeah, pretty passive. Okay. What's catchy. really catchy? It's catchy. Yeah. Super catchy. What's interesting to me about these girl groups is one that these groups are not interracial. They're either yeah. all white or they're all black, but they're not ever a mix of groups. Why not? I don't know. I guess because it was the 60s. I think it was because we're in the height of the civil rights movement, mm-hmm. and that would have been just one step too far. So it was okay to go watch a group of young black females perform, yeah. but it would not have been okay to go watch an interracial group of young women perform. That would have been just a little too progressive and a little too much at the time. Mm-hmm. So overall, these groups sell millions of records. They are going to make a number of millionaires at the height of this. They um, became millionaires? No, the girls did not become millionaires. Oh. They made millionaires. We'll talk about that here in a minute. At the height of this, some academics say that there might have been up to 1,500 different girl groups throughout the United States and the UK. That's crazy. That's crazy. But only about a dozen became lastingly famous. Okay. Um, Just in the chart toppers, so top Mm -hmm. 50, we have 750 different girl groups from 1960 to 1966. Really? Yeah. How many? 750. That's a lot. It's a lot. Wow. Wow. The thing about these groups is a lot of times these girls are performing songs that have been written for them or written for a girl group in general, not necessarily for them specifically. Okay. So generic girl group song. Yes. Okay. But they're not playing instruments. Most of the time they're not writing the music themselves. Mm -hmm. And even when they do write it, they don't get the credit for it. And so the girls in these girl groups become almost interchangeable. Mm. The group themselves might have been a star, but not individuals. There are exceptions. Diana Ross is an exception. Sure. But for the most part, the girls are interchangeable. Yeah, and I'm thinking even the modern-day counterpart 
right of of a uh, girl group uh you know groups like tlc but we knew all of their names yes um and, and they wrote their own music yeah. for the most part or at least they had some influence over what the music was that they were producing yeah these girls for the most part do not i want to give you an example of that okay so rosalie rosalie hamelin is from rosie and the originals i've never heard of this you probably have not okay but you might have heard their only hit song it went to number five on the charts. It's Angel Baby. I don't think so. So 1960, Angel Baby. hits number five. It's the highest it gets. She wrote the song at the age of 15. She wrote it. She wrote it. But her contract said she was ineligible to get writer's credit. What? Yeah. So she doesn't get the royalties from it. She writes it. She performs it. She doesn't make any money off of it. Wow. Yeah. Super fun, huh? <sighs> I don't like that story, Misty. I'm sorry. Tell me a different story. Okay, I will tell you a different story that's a little bit more positive. Okay, good. Let's talk about the Shirelles. Ooh, the Shirelles I know. Y'all, Allegra is jamming out. I still think not a feminist anthem. Not a feminist anthem, but let me tell you about them as a group. Hold on. So we come out of the gate swinging and that, right? Tonight you're mine. Get your hopes up. But then you're like, oh. So the, the question is, if we have intercourse, will you still like me tomorrow well and the narrator is putting all of the onus on virtue on Mm -hmm. the female Mm -hmm. because it's assumed that the male is going to want to have intercourse and it's up to the female to stop it right so definitely we're playing on some old traditional tropes here right what it means to be female Mm -hmm. and to guard your virtue right yeah and it's still up to the man to decide whether the relationship would continue yeah exactly again the passive role yes But the Shirelles in real life are not that passive. Okay, that's good. So they actually began organically. They were four friends from high school. Nice. They are not put together by a record label. They chose to be in a group themselves. They start recording in 1958, um, but they don't have a big hit until 1960. Mm -hmm. So that song we just played, Will You Love Me Tomorrow, Mm -hmm. was their number one hit in 1960, and it stayed at the top of the charts for 15 weeks. Wow. Yeah, so pretty important. They are the first all black girl group to have a number one hit in the United States. So landmark. Yeah. So these girls are very young when they start performing and within about two years, they have a number of really important hits. Uh, We just played, will you still love me tomorrow? Dedicated to the one I love. Mm -hmm. Mama said, baby, it's you. All of these came within two years. Mm -hmm. They were 17 years old. Wow. Yes. So, it makes sense that mm-hmm. you're not going to hand a 17-year-old a wad of cash. Yeah. Because Allegra, if you'd have had millions of dollars at 17, would you have made good decisions? I would have gotten like 12 Weezer tattoos. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to do that. Right. So these girls are told that their money from their royalties is going into a trust fund and that on their 21st birthdays, they will receive their trust fund. You want to take a guess? Are you about to break my heart, Missy? A little bit. <sighs> So they're part of Spectre Records, and when they turn 21, they like are- Phil Spectre? Like Phil Spectre. Okay. He, he produced a lot of these girl groups. Um, he creates what they call the Wall of Sound. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they turn 21, and then they're told their money does not exist. It's been spent. The record label says it's spent on promoting their records, on their travel, and on touring. And they are a little bit upset. You think a little bit, but the Shirelles have become such a popular group that they're able to do something that none of these other girl groups are able to do. Burn everything to the ground. Almost. They went on strike. Nice. Yeah. So they refused to tour, to sing or to record until they get paid. Did they get paid? Took about two years and a lawsuit. Two years. Yeah. Wow. And a lawsuit, (sighs) but they got paid. Now, I'll say some of these girl groups are still suing in the 1980s. 
to get the royalties they feel that they're old, owed. Oh my gosh. And depending on what state they issue their lawsuit in, some of them win, some of them don't. That's crazy. It is crazy. But at least in this case, the Shirelles were able to get paid back. Yeah. And um, they're also going to be inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996. 96. 96. About 40 years after they debuted. Okay. It took us some time. A little bit. All right. There's one other girl group that we have to talk about. Okay. Who's that? The Supremes. Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> oh, yeah. The Supremes. So the Supremes start out under a couple of different names. Again, they're organically formed mm-hmm. teenage friends. And you know at least one of these ladies. Diana Ross. Diana Ross. Yeah. Uh, Mary Wilson and Florence Ballard are the other forming members of the group. Okay. So over the years, they tried a couple different things and a couple different sounds. They don't hit it big until 1964. Mm-hmm. But when they finally hit it big, Where Did Our Love Go? goes to number one and sells two million copies. What do you think about these lyrics? Still not great. Why not? I mean, it's still very passive. Yes. And it's still very, you know, are you going to love me? Are you going to... I don't know. (laughs) You don't like the surrender line? (laughs) No, I definitely don't like the surrender line. So they're going to follow this up. With two more number one hits in 1964. Wow. Baby Love and Come See About Me. Oh, yeah. Come See About Me. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not good, is it? It's still passive, but it is catchy. You can't deny it's catchy. No, they're it's it's very well it's made. well produced. Yeah. We're still just crying though. Waiting for a guy, sitting around, just, hoping. Just a lot of crying. So this group is the most successful girl group ever. Okay. As far as record sales go and just the amount of money they made. Yeah, and definitely lasting influence. Yeah, recognition and influence. For sure. And of course, it launches the solo career of Diana Ross, which Mm -hmm. is going to be important a little bit later. Yeah. However, Mm -hmm. a lot of their success is due to this very specific sound and look, Mm -hmm. which they did not necessarily create. There was actually this thing called the Motown Finishing School. Wow. Okay. (laughs) Where they are put through courses, essentially, in dance, etiquette, and fashion. So many women being put into etiquette school in the 50s and 60s. Right. Because you have to act, look, and behave a certain way. So I'm going to pitch an idea to you. Is it starting an etiquette school? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to be supportive of that particular idea. I don't think you'd be successful at that particular <laughs> idea. I would not. So I would pitch to you that these girl groups, while they're super important and they do allow women to have the spotlight. Mm-hmm. They are more performers than they are artists. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. And they obviously skilled and hardworking. For sure. But talented. So talented. Cogs in a machine. Yes. A man owned, male owned machine. Yes. So with the Supremes, a lot of their success is not credited necessarily just to them, but to Barry Gordy. Okay. Yeah. And he is originator of Motown Records. Founder. Founder. That's the word I couldn't remember. (laughs) The originator. English teacher. I mean, that sounds like a superhero, the originator. (laughs) That's a good substitute word when I couldn't think of founder. Yeah. And I mean, he's a he's an anomaly, uh, right? He's himself a musician, a person of color, starts his own record label. Mm -hmm. So because of these girls being seen as performers and not artists, Mm -hmm. Their contributions to music were overlooked for a long time, Mm -hmm. and that's being corrected. Good. So the Library of Congress has a cultural preservation program, and they're starting to include these girl groups. So the National Record, sorry, National Recording Registry Mm -hmm. has included the Ronettes, Be My Baby, Mm -hmm. and Martha and the Vandals, Dancing in the Street. Interesting. 
interesting place to start. I think it's a good choice because we're not sitting around crying over a guy, right? Yeah. We're celebrating mm -hmm. dancing in the streets. Misty's watching me dance. <laughs> it's not pretty. It's pretty good. All right. So overall, Allegra. Yeah. Does the girl group phenomenon show female empowerment mm -hmm. and the rise of this new female voice mm -hmm. or does it still rely too heavily on old ideas of what it means to be a woman in America and traditional femininity? So it depends on which part you're asking me about. If you're asking about the girls themselves, I would say that they are kind of proto empowering women, right? So they're not necessarily given the opportunity to take charge of their careers or their music, but they're definitely demonstrating what women can do in the field of music. So they're like trailblazing. Yes. But the way that girl groups were treated culturally and by the music industry is definitely uh, not progressive in any way, right? The way they were paid, the way they were kind of interchangeable, the way their the individuals' names for the most part didn't matter. All of those things, they're not is, valued. Yeah, it's more of the same. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I think though there are a few women in the '60s who are solo performers mm -hmm. that we have a different view of. Okay, so are there? Do you think there are some some good lady anthems from the time period? I, will, I don't know if I'm going to say lady anthems, but I'm going to say lady role models. Okay. So okay. Um, we're in Texas. We are. Let's start with a Texas girl. Okay. So tell me about Janis Joplin. So Janis Joplin is from Port Arthur, Texas. Nice. And if you didn't know that, the reason you don't know it. I didn't really. Is because she had a pretty unhappy childhood and early adulthood in Texas. Oh. Yeah. Um, she stands out. She's a little different. She's not blending in we've talked about consensus culture in the mm -hmm, 50s mm -hmm. mm -mm. she's not getting her haircut like everybody else wearing the poodle skirt okay. she's not doing it no so she's bullied pretty intensely uh she's eventually going to go to ut austin cool for an art major nice yeah except for when she gets there she's voted ugliest man on campus Jesus. yeah so not doing great so she leaves texas behind and i would too <laughs> yes, my god and moves to california and when she moves to California, she is going to embrace this new role as a performer, a singer and a performer. You hear this music, right? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine her in a sequin dress doing a shimmy? I mean, I can. No. No. It's grittier. Mm -hmm. It's more authentic, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's more emotion than crying. Right. And she's not waiting for a man, right? Right. Now she's maybe crying over a man. Yeah, but the song has a wider range of emotion. She's also playing the guitar. Yes. Yeah. So she can perform as a musician mm -hmm. as well as just a singer. Mm -hmm. I will say she also divides the divides some conventions on what a quote unquote girl singer should be. So she gets arrested. For uh, what? <laughs> vulgarity towards police officers in Tampa, Florida. Wow. Yeah. If you're vulgar in Florida, you're very vulgar. Right. Yeah. So she is becoming famous. She is beginning to get a lot of recognition and renown. And then, unfortunately, in 1970, she died of a heroin overdose. Mm. Her first number one hit is actually the year after she dies, Me and Bobby McGee. Mm -hmm. Now, since her death, Texas has kind of reclaimed her yeah. as one of our own. I don't know if we really have the right to do that since we chased I, her out of the yeah, state. Yeah, I don't really feel like we should have either. Calling her the ugliest man. But. Yeah. This um, is a good song. Yeah, it really is. Bobby thumbed a diesel down just before it rained and rode us all the way to New Orleans. I pulled my harpoon out of my dirty red bandana. I was playing soft while Bobby sang the blues. Did you know she played at Woodstock? We sang every song I think I did know that. Yeah. I think I've seen pictures of that. Just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing. I mean, nothing. 
I think she's a good bridge to the 1970s mm -hmm. because women are going to be less of the girl group mm -hmm. and more of this musician performer. Absolutely. Singer songwriter. Yeah. Uh, but before we leave the 1960s, there's one more lady I want to talk about. Okay. I'm ready for it. So I want to talk about Leslie Gore. And if you have no idea who that is, you do know at least one of her songs. If you say so, then I will choose to believe you. You know her 1963 hit, It's My Party, and, and I'll, I'll Cry, cry if, if I, I Want, want to. to. But that's not the song I want to talk about, because again, that's sitting around crying over a guy, right? The song I want to talk about that she did is also from 1963, mm -hmm. but it's You Don't Own Me. Oh, that's a nice title. Yeah. Well, I feel like we're moving forward. We are a little bit. good yeah don't try to change me in so i think we've got a first lady anthem yeah so she recorded this mm -hmm. at the age of 17 wow yeah so for a lot of women in the 1960s they actually refer to this song as bringing them into the second wave feminist movement okay because she is singing here about the option to say no. Yeah. And to have her own agency. Right. Don't put me on display. Yeah. Right. I want to be free. Mm -hmm. This is a really new idea in mm -hmm. American music. You want to hear the bad part of this? Why is there always a downside with you, Missy? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just how history is. We are a group of sad, sad people that ruin things for everyone else. That is my experience with historians. So, it's sung by Leslie Gore. Yeah. But it's written by two men. Of course it is. Uh, John Madeira and David White. And while it may have been a feminist anthem, mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily supposed to be. An unintentional lady anthem is An what you're saying. Unintentional. Me. It was just supposed to be a hit. It was just, just a, a pop, pop song. Just okay. a pop song. Okay. Yeah. Um, when she was asked about it later... She said, I was 17. <laughs> so it's not like she's making this grand feminist statement, even yeah. though other people yeah. interpreted it that way. Now, the first time I ever heard this song was from the movie The First Wives Club. Never seen that movie. I need you to go watch this movie. I need you to do this. I think they're remaking it. What? <laughs> okay, you got real emotional about that. I think they're remaking it. Yeah, they can't do that. Well, they are. I'm no. still, I don't know what to tell you. No. I think they're remaking it into a TV show. No. On perhaps TBS or TNT. <sighs> no. Why does everything have to get ruined? I don't know what this movie is, so I have okay, no so emotional it's commitment. Bette Midler. No, lover. Diane Keaton. Lover. Goldie Hawn. Love everything about her. And they are all first wives who are getting revenge on their husbands who have left them. That sounds like it would be a good movie for me to watch. You need to watch this movie. It's And they sing this song in it. They, the the women do yeah that's a good song yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. so please watch this movie yeah I mean I don't uh, check back in with me on the next podcast I need to know that you watch this of of all the things that you have never seen or read or experienced I, because you're busy I, doing research I have homework yes I saw this movie in theaters <sighs> then it's good it's real good if I watch this movie at home you have to go to a movie theater oh man I don't know if I can take that <sighs> You know what? I will do it. Okay. I will go to watch a movie if you will watch this. That's a that's a bet. You tell me about this movie. I want a book report about this movie. I want a book report about your popcorn. <laughs> you want my receipts? Yeah. I'll I show mean, you proof that I actually Send me some went. selfies. All right. So overall in the 1960s, mm -hmm. women only made up 22% of all number one hits. Not good. Not great. Mm -mm. But... This is the first decade they had number one hits. Mm -hmm. So we went from zero to 22%. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. Uh, the Supremes become the leading female act. They are going to tie uh, fifth most chart toppers of any group in history. Wow. Yeah. And we have this movement of at least getting women on stage. Yeah. So they're becoming more heard, mm -hmm. if not necessarily superstars. Okay. So then we're going to jump to the 1970s. And you're going to tell me that everything gets a lot better for women. 
Yeah, it uh, becomes a female utopia. Really? No, Aww. not at all. Well, that's a bummer. So the 1970s do start out a big bummer, musically speaking. In the first two years, Jimi Hendrix dies, Janis Joplin dies, Jim Morrison dies, and then the Beatles broke up. Well, and then nationally, the Vietnam War is yeah. going on. Thanks, um, history teacher. Sorry. Uh, prominent leaders have been assassinated. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer of a time. It's a very bad time. Nixon's president. So um, I would postulate that recorded music reached its peak of importance in the 1970s. What do you mean by that? So it's obviously always been important. Yes. And continues to this day. Obviously, we still listen to recorded music. Yes. But in the 70s, we had a confluence of two things. So it was more available and more affordable. So we were making vinyl records. If you think of the 1970s, you're imagining teenagers flipping through records in a record store. Yeah. Um, probably with wearing, their bell bottoms wearing corduroy yeah um and so it's affordable and available as recorded music but there's also not very much competition so once we get into the 80s and 90s we used to have more competition from movies from tv we get you know more than five tv channels sporting events become more popular so my entertainment dollar is spent is on spent, other things yeah and, okay. and your and your attention is diverted to many other things. So I'm obviously not arguing that recorded music is no longer important. I mean, right. as a person who listens to it all the time, I obviously wouldn't say that. But I think its peak of importance is probably in the 70s. I want to add one more thing to that. Is it about disco? No. Oh. It's not. Uh, another reason that music, I think, is so important in the 70s is because our country was so divided yeah. on a lot of these things. Absolutely. And especially if you were feeling isolated mm -hmm maybe in your own community, you mm -hmm. could pick up a record with mm -hmm. a band that had the same political leaning or a message you agreed with, and suddenly you didn't feel so isolated. Because there's no internet. Right. You can't just get on a chat room or Reddit and connect with your people. Right. And and you didn't have uh, as many forums, even on TV, to, to explore different viewpoints. I mean, that's when the news was, you know, just the facts. In the 1970s, we started spending about $2 billion dollars a year on recorded music. Uh, that's almost twice as much as people were spending on going to the movies. Uh, and live sporting events, people were spending $600 million. But uh, That so seems so low now. It is. That's so crazy well, low. Well, I mean, there were fewer teams and there are fewer sports that people cared about that's in true. the 70s. That's true. If I think about... If you think about movies from the 70s, TV shows from the 70s, people were not going to sporting events they weren't spending a lot of time watching them on tv it just wasn't as important as it is now i mean right. mm -hmm. our, we have a whole s season dedicated to basically football culturally yes so and that wasn't necessarily the case people were watching sports and going to sporting events but to the tune of 600 million dollars a year as opposed to americans spending two billion a year on music so uh, that's why i think peak of importance now we're still we spend more than that now obviously but um again tv did, had just a few channels video games were not really popular yet and middle class families all had home stereos starting in the 70s so 70s dads were making their kids probably listen to 50s music oh, okay. i'm guessing is what was happening but the other thing about music in the 70s is we started to have more genres we had soul and funk. This is when we have, you know, Isaac Hayes and Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. Motown is increasing in popularity. We have the Jackson 5 making records in the 70s. Uh, folk music, like Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell. Uh, Anti-war music, yep. Yeah, absolutely. We had, we had kind of pop and rock music, and we had big... This is when, like, stadium bands started touring, bands like Queen. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, and Elton John and Dave Bowie were important in the 70s so music itself just gains cultural significance and of course the other reason that music is so significant in the 70s is disco do you love disco i i do not you don't love i associate disco with roller skating rings because i feel like every birthday party i went to in the 1980s we went roller skating <laughs> And there was always a disco ball. There was a lot of roller skating. And there was a lot of disco music. Yeah. And I don't know if at the time that was retro or it was just what the roller skating ring could afford to so, purchase. Disco continued to be popular into the 80s. Okay. And that's when we started getting disco sucks. Uh, okay. You know, if we started to become fans of, you know, the Rolling Stones or Cream or something. But 
disco was mostly popular in the 70s and even rock bands released disco-ish songs uh dance song i mean what's dance music people were going to dance clubs yeah i guess that's true and so people were trying to get music that would be played in dance clubs and then people would go the next day and buy the record so they could kind of replicate the experience uh in their in their living rooms you know on their so home tell stereo me systems about, tell me about disco allegra this is donna summer these lyrics are not real in-depth she basically just says, I'm in love a lot. This song's called I Feel Love. So that's all she's going to do. It's a dance song, right? So this is not built for its lyricism. Feminist anthem? No. I mean, it's better than what you were playing earlier. Because she's saying, I feel love. And she's not crying. Right. And she's falling in free. I, I swear to you, if you look up the lyrics, it's just her saying, I feel love repeatedly because it's a dance song. She says, I got you a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> but so more progressive, I think, than what the girl groups were doing, but not super deep. We're not making any kind of social statement necessarily. Well, you know, one thing that is, I think, more progressive here mm -hmm. is that we know Donna Summer's name. That's true. Yeah. I mean, she is a star. And it's, yeah, I mean, star of, yeah, and queen of disco. Yes, yeah, so I think that's important, right, though? Mm -hmm. Because she's not interchangeable. Right. You're not going to just randomly put somebody else up on stage. People are going to be like, wait a minute, that is not Donna Summer. Exactly. Yeah. And another popular disco act is a, we had bands, right? Yes. You're familiar with the, concept of a band <laughs> yes. where somebody plays an instrument and or sings in a group yeah so we had a lot of groups in the 70s that were mixtures of males and females one of those bands was very popular on the disco crowd specifically european disco but became popular oh i actually know this this is abba i feel like i earned a gold star so this is another song about dancing so it's not very deep, but it's about a woman enjoying, a 17-year-old girl actually, enjoying going out on the weekends and dancing. So not deep, but still kind of forward momentum building here because it's, a, it's, it's not about waiting around for a man to take you dancing, I guess. It's about doing something that she's enjoying, right? Now, is ABBA all girls? Uh, no. Okay. They're like Swedish, yes, yes. They're European, yes. Okay, cool. Do you want more disco? I, I think we can move on. I get the idea. <laughs> it's dancing. We're going to go dancing or roller skating in my case. So some other popular music in the 70s is, uh, I believe they're called Chick Chic, C-H-I-C. Okay. You know them. I do. Oh. So this is another example of a group of musicians, male and female. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is very disco, if you can hear the beat. I feel like we need to, like, a lighted dance floor in here. We do. And we need to, what, platform shoes? Yeah. Yeah. So, there are some not great lyrics in this song, uh, but I don't know that people are really listening to the songs in the disco era. I mean, there's the lyric, boys will be boys, which is problematic for me. And girls will be girls. Ponytails and curls. You know, so. <laughs> is that really in here? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Awesome. So, again, not a feminist anthem. No. Okay. But it's a fun song, and it's uh, it's about having fun, man. And I don't know what to tell you. People wanted to have fun in the 70s. So, as I said, uh, we have several bands in the 70s with female singers. Do you want to know another yes, prominent, of course. important, any? Absolutely. 
Are you asking me to name one? Yeah. Oh, no, I can't do that. Uh, this is Stevie Nicks and her band, Something Something. Fleetwood Mac. That's the one. Yeah. So, again, a band with males and females. Uh, Stevie Nicks, obviously, singing the song. Uh, and this was... She's the only person from this band I can name. Well, Fleetwood is the name of a man. This is his last name. Oh. Well, that's important then. <laughs> I was just going to say, she's like the standout star to me. She is. And that's and that's remarkable as well, that she is the the person whose name that we remember. And she's the standout star. Even though her name group. is not in the band, <laughs> band name. No. And this is a, this is a more... I don't want to say political song necessarily, but it's more... It's a heavier song. Yeah, it's more We're not serious. just going out dancing. Yeah. The difference to me is that it's a man and a woman singing this kind of not really a breakup song but kind of a reflection back on a relationship song and so it's not a woman saying you don't love me the they're both saying it right so it's 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 a, less passive yeah it's a gender neutral uh song about relationships well and the band yeah. wrote the music right yes so they're active in the production of it, not just in the yeah, performance I mean they wrote, they it. wrote, yeah, they wrote all of their songs, and I mean they credited every member of the band as writers of all of the songs, as far as I know. Okay. What I didn't know until I was doing research for today is that Stevie Nicks' first name was Stephanie. Oh, I didn't know that either. Now you do. So another uh, important artist of the time is uh, Blondie. Okay. Are you familiar with Blondie? Vaguely. You think that Blondie belongs in the 80s? Yeah, I think so. I think in my brain, that's where I put them. See, here's the thing, Allegra. I was raised on country and or Western music. Are those different? They are different. And so this is all very foreign to me. I was raised on a lot of like Sammy Kershaw, Merle Haggard, Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson's good. Yeah. So um, I'm learning a lot. Okay, good. I think this is why this academic research was fun for me. Because it was like a new culture. I thought you meant the fun part was listening to this amazing music. That too. Yeah, I think of this as 80s. It's 80s sound, yeah. But she started this in the This song's from the 70s. I have to be careful. There's a curse word coming up. But so this is a love song or a relationship song, but it's a little more active. She's singing a little more almost not necessarily angry but definitely she's more willing to walk away or to protest or to express something other than crying over a man she's able to put agency into it she's not just waiting around on the phone and crying yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. So, again, I don't know if it's a lady anthem. I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm necessarily finding it to be empowering, but it's definitely not regressive or playing into stereotypes. She is in control of her own life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so she's expressing emotions that are related to relationships, but that she's not uh, just passively accepting everything that happens and bemoaning her fate necessarily. I want a real lady anthem. You want a real? I want a real lady anthem from the 1970s. Luckily, the lady anthem is from the 1970s. All right. The lady anthem. It remains today. Do you know what it is? I don't yet. Okay. Oh, yes, I do. It's uh, I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar. roar But I don't know who sings it. Helen Reddy. to go back and pretend Cause I've heard it all before And I've been down there on the floor No one's ever gonna keep me down again Well, yes, I am wise But it's wisdom for the pain Yes, I paid the price But look how much I gained
so obviously Lady Anthem. Yes. And this time it was intentional. Yes. Unlike Leslie Gore. Who was 17 and just singing with the record producer right. told her to. This was definitely a call to second wave feminists. And it was effective. I mean, I can I can tell you that my mom, who was a teenager, early 20s in the 70s, is listening right now crying because this song is so meaningful to her. And she's not alone, obviously. So I think the lyrics in this yeah. are super important. And I think the lyrics are very empowering. Oh, yeah. The music's a little dated. Yeah, I mean... A little bit. But I don't know if I could jam out to this in my car. I could jam out to this in my car. So, did Helen Reddy write this as well? I don't know. Do you? I do. Okay. Just because I Googled it. Okay. Google says... I was afraid. Google says... She wrote it. That she wrote it. Good. Um, but with a songwriting partner, Ray Burton. That's all right. Yeah. She wrote it. And there's a lot of female songwriting happening in the 1970s. I mean, the other one who comes to mind, of course, is Joni Mitchell. Mm-hmm. And she was writing all of her music as well. So we have a lot of forward progress in the 1970s in terms of participation in rock bands, in terms of uh, solo artists, even solo disco artists becoming notable for their own skill and their own talent. And we have people like Helen Reddy and Joni Mitchell writing songs, performing songs, uh, and becoming famous and notable and influential uh, during the 1970s. So there's, I do have to tell you, okay, the number one song of the decade, okay, is not going to be a song you find particularly inspiring. All right, I'm excited, but it's sung by a woman. Okay, that's the good news. Number one song of the 1970s, sung by a woman. Positive, positive. No. Allegra, no. This cannot be the number one song. It is. Yeah, she's waiting. So many dreams. No. I don't know what to tell you. I want to see your facts. Alone in the dark. This is it. Be is. This is it. Here we're coming up to the chorus. This beat Fleetwood Mac. Dude, this beat David Bowie, Elton John, and Queen. So if I'm in my roller skating days, this is the couple skate. This is definitely the couple skate. But uh, this is not a lady anthem. No, it's not. It's not even good. (laughs) Well, first of all, it's not good. Uh, apologies to all of the Debbie Boone fans we have joining us on the podcast today, but it is not good. And I just want to personally register my objection to the notion that a man can light up your life. That's it. I'm just registering that objection right now. Your life should be lit up all on its own. You light up your own life, Misty. I'm going to light up my own. (laughs) No one else lights up my life for me. I'm just going to register an objection to it being bad. It's, it's not just not good. Musically sound. <laughs> no. I mean, I am woman, hear me worse, a little dated. Like, I definitely hear the 70s in it. But I don't want to run fleeing from the room. <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't run away from the room. So that's the good news. Well, you turned it off. I, well, I did. So there's one more song. Uh, I have a song I want to talk about, too, in the 1970s. What's your song? I was going to say there's one more song that we can count as a very important lady anthem. I really hope we're talking about the same song. To do uh, palate cleansing from what you just heard. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But then I spent so many This isn't the song I want to talk about, but it's a good song. Me wrong, and I grew strong. And I learned how. I really think we need to release a music video of you lip singing to this. All 
All right, give us the stats on this song. So this song obviously remains popular to this day. We all know the words to it. I don't know if you went roller skating to this song. Probably. This is Gloria Gaynor uh, singing I Will Survive. And this is a counter to a lot of songs that were happening in the 1960s and 70s. And she's saying, I gave you everything I had. You messed it up. Get out. And you know what? I will survive. So she is not sitting around waiting for him to call her back. She, no, she's kicking him out of her house. And yeah. not only that, she's saying, I'm going to be fine. You go. I like it. Yeah. No, it's a great song. It's very disco. Oh, yeah. But it's empowering. Yeah. And so and this is a song that people knew the words to. Mm-hmm. While they were dancing, yes, just like I'm doing now, right? Yes. They're mouthing along. I'm, I'm. You're lucky. I'm not singing. <laughs> it's very hard for me to not sing this song. I can only imagine your drive home is just going to be one massive jam out session. Absolutely, but I'm going to add, you know, a lot of songs. Yeah. Can we talk about the song I want to talk about? <sighs> Some people are so needy. Yes. So I want to talk about Loretta Lynn. Okay. And you, I, you think she's got a lady anthem for the I 70s? I think she has a pretty important lady anthem. Okay. Lay it on me. 1975. Okay. The pill. The pill. The pill. Metaphorical pill? The birth control pill. Literal pill. Literal pill. Wow. And me when I was your girl. So this is a country song. Yes. Country pop. I should have guessed. From Loretta Lynn. <laughs> Wow. I'm tearing down your brooder house Cause now I've got the pill All these years I've stayed at home While you had all your fun And every year that's gone by Another baby's come There's gonna be some changes made Right here on Nursery Hill You set this chicken your last time Cause now I've got the pill Wow, how do you think this went over? Widely accepted No, no, okay So, especially coming from a country artist Mm -hmm. This doesn't go over real well Is it popular? I will say it's popular with certain groups But there were country music stations that refused to play it Really? Yeah Wow in her home state of Kentucky, there are preachers who use their Sunday morning pulpits to talk about how this is an ungodly song. Are you serious? Yeah, it's immoral. Because if you listen to the lyrics, she's not saying, my husband and I have sat down and we talked about this. And yeah. We're going to get on the birth control pill. Yeah. She's saying, you're not treating me like this anymore because I got the pill now. Right. Yeah. I'm going to do what I want to do now. So there's going to be some changes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So, and this song, I don't know if you know this, it was actually semi-autobiographical for her. Oh. Yeah. So, she embraced the pill when it came out. Okay. And, again, you might not know this either. Contraceptive even... I do know some things. I know, but this is... It's a very history thing. Okay. Contraceptive for married couples was actually illegal until 1968 nationwide. Um, there were some states what? that were okay with it, but until 1968 with Griswold v. Connecticut... Married couples in every state did not have the right to birth control. What? Yeah. So you and your husband would go to a doctor and you would ask for birth control as a couple and the doctor could say no. What? <laughs> I don't... I'm, it's not It's not working in my brain. That's not registering what you're saying. I don't understand. Right. So for her to acknowledge mm-hmm. taking the pill and how it's going to change her life mm-hmm. is groundbreaking. Yeah. And especially in a form like this in music. I have a quote from her that I want to read you. Yeah. If I'd have had the pill back when I was having babies, I'd have taken them like popcorn. (laughs) The pill is good for people. I wouldn't trade my kids for anyone, but I wouldn't necessarily have had six and I (laughs) sure would have spaced them better. Okay. So she's singing about something that a lot of women felt and were going through. Mm -hmm. So even though there was some judgment, and I'm going to say that it mostly came from men. Probably, yeah, that's probably the case. She still felt like this song was important enough that she released it, and she stood by it. All right, so like her overall, tell me about 70s music reflecting the times for women. 
I'm going to do that, and in fact, I'm going to use a single example to encapsulate how 70s music reflected the forward progress of women's movements. Okay. So you remember a song you told us about earlier, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? Yes. It was written by a songwriting group, King and Goffin, who wrote a lot of songs for girl groups, a lot of songs for the Beatles, and for a long time, people did not know who those two people were. Uh, I'm going to assume that people thought they were both men. They did. They were often called Mr. King and Mr. Goffin. But one of those two people was a woman, Carol King. She wrote Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow with her songwriting partner. And she wrote a lot of songs for the Beatles. But she did not become known in her own right until the 70s. So then she was writing or co-writing her own music and also singing it and also becoming known for it. And she had lots of popular songs, songs that you may still recognize. I feel the earth move on the monkey. I feel the sky tumbling down. I feel my heart start to tremble in whenever you're around. Oh, baby. So it's all uh... Devotional, right? It's kind of devoted to a man or a dude. But um, it's, she wrote it. She's performing it. She's playing the instrument. So, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of forward progress. And she is coming from the shadows of not being known at all and being a behind-the-scenes influencer and person responsible for other people's success to becoming successful and known in her own right. And I think all of that's kind of a metaphor for what's happening to women's music in the 70s. So before we finish talking about the 70s, I do want to talk to you about Motown. Okay. You mentioned Barry Gordy and Motown earlier. Obviously, they started before the 70s. But they continue to be prominent and important in the 70s as a record label. And this goes back to something you said in our scary movie episode. Oh, man, way back. (laughs) Which was that if we want... uh, uh, More inclusive? Yeah, if we want more voices to be heard, if we want to hear about more things than dancing queens and crying at home, if we want to see better representation, so if we want to be able to look at and listen to famous musicians who in some way resemble ourselves, then we can't just hire different singers. We have to have different creators. And so Barry Gordy started Motown Records. He himself was a musician, a person of color, and he started a record label to bring more new voices into the music industry. Now, most of the recording artists on Motown in the 70s were male, right? The Jackson 5, Marvin Gaye, uh, Smokey Robinson was a Motown artist. Yeah. Did not know that. The Commodores. Okay. But also there were some great female artists recording Motown music in the 70s, including The Temptations, The Supremes, Gladys Knight and the Pips. That's a good one. Uh, and so I want to talk, I want to play a little bit uh, of some Motown music from the 70s and talk about it. The first one is is a song by Thelma Houston. And to be really honest with you, I don't know if it's a feminist anthem. I mean, I know that it's not. And it's not necessarily <laughs> progressive. And even when I tell you the name of the song. Okay. Don't leave me this way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of, it's, so we're still crying for our men. Yeah. But uh, it's a musical achievement in and of itself, that it became one of the top Motown hits of the 70s sung by female artists. Okay, so it's important even if it's not progressive. Yeah, yeah. Still sounds kind of disco-y. It's very disco-y. I can't stay alive without your love. Ugh. Still better than Debbie Boone. Well, you know, not much is worse. 
This song uh, is included, or lyrics from this song. Here we go. Okay, I think I know this part. Yeah. It's very 70s, very disco. Part of the song is included uh, in Moulin Rouge. Okay. Uh, don't leave me this way. So if you're a big Moulin Rouge fan, you might recognize some of those lyrics as well. So we're going to listen to one more Motown song, Misty. Okay. We're going to listen to a Gladys Knight song. This is Gladys Knight and the Pips. This is this Midnight Train to Georgia? No, this one is called Neither One of Us. Oh, Midnight Train to Georgia is better. I don't need your attitude. All right. <laughs> Misty, what's next in your lady life? Well, what is next in my lady life is more fun academic research because our next episode is on music of the 80s. And 90s. Yeah, but we don't need to research that. We were there. But don't just say it's the 80s. Well, I have to do research on the 80s, Okay. which I'm excited about. I don't need to do any research on the 90s. You got it? I got it. I know all about it. I know everything there is to know about it. I'm excited. It's not true. I don't know everything, but... So what's next in your lady life? Well, I have to go see this movie. I have to go home and watch the, the first, first Wives Club. The First Wives Club. Yeah, I want an oral report. Tell me what you think about it. Okay. And then you'll go to the movies. Then I will go to a movie. In a movie theater. In a movie theater. I will pay actual money to go see a movie in a movie theater. U.S. dollars. <laughs> U.S. dollars, yes. Thank you for listening to this episode of Profess Hers, our podcast about seeing movies, culture, and history through our lady eyes. I'm Misty, and you don't own me. And I'm Allegra. I'm a dancing queen. We'd love to hear from you, what you thought about today's episode, what you'd like us to discuss in future episodes, or how great you think we are. It's pretty great. To connect with us, you can follow us on Twitter at Profess Hers, that's P-R-O-F-E-S-S-H-E-R-S, or by email, same address, professhers at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who has been listening, commenting, liking, and reviewing our podcast. Please keep doing that. The best way to keep up with us is to subscribe. We hope that you recommend our podcast to a friend and check out other podcasts from the TCC Connect faculty. Our podcast is written by Misty and me. And remember, have some heart. Barrel Kura.